This episode of Harvey Brownstone Interviews is brought to you by the Harvey Brownstone Talk Show Blend Coffee, available at hollywoodblends.com. Everyone's saying it's the best coffee they've ever tasted. Why not give it a try and see for yourself? Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today's guest is a brilliant guitarist and singer-songwriter who's been entertaining music lovers for over 30 years with his unique fusion of rock, swing, and blues. He's released 20 highly acclaimed albums with multi-platinum record sales featuring hit singles including Voodoo Thing, Five Long Years, Just Came Back, Keep On Loving Me Baby, Stay, Freedom, Savior, Riding in the Moonlight, and my personal favorite, his beautiful rendition of the Van Morrison classic, Into the Mystic. He is widely credited with launching the Swing Revival thanks to his immensely popular Little Bink Band, which has released four successful albums and brought us some great hit songs like Cadillac Baby, Surely I Love You, Breaking Up the House, and If You Need Me. And the Little Big Band Christmas album should be a staple in everyone's Christmas music collection. Our guest has worked with some of the greatest and most influential artists, including Stevie Ray Vaughan, Bonnie Raitt, Keith Richards, Lenny Kravitz, Mavis Staples, John Hammond Jr., Carlos Santana, Jeff Healy, and Buddy Guy. And his music has been recorded by artists as diverse as Maria Maldar, Johnny Halliday, and Lucinda Williams. His concert tours across North America are always sold out. He's won eight Juno Awards and 30 Maple Blues Awards. And in 2013, he was inducted into the Canadian Music Industry Hall of Fame. I'm delighted and honored to welcome the incomparable Colin James to our show. Colin, thank you so much for being here. My pleasure. My pleasure indeed. What kind of music did you enjoy listening to when you were growing up? There was a lot, you know. I have siblings, and of course, my mom and dad were folk revivalists, you know, coming out of the late 50s and, and early 60s. So they were, they would have been exemplified by the people who didn't like when Bob Dylan went electric, you know. They liked the acoustic Bob Dylan. So I grew up with like a lot of folk music, like, you know, like anyone else, Joan Baez and Bob Dylan and uh, Neil Young and um, Pete Seeger and all that folk revival. But then as as life morphed out of the late 60s into the 70s, they were like anyone else were listening to the band and, you know, more popular uh, rock music when everything took a shift. So kind of grew up with all kinds of music. Now, of course, it's very well known that you got your big break by opening on tour for the legendary Stevie Ray Vaughan. What would you say was the most important thing you learned from him as an artist? Stevie had a way with people. So I think number one was no matter what was going on in his life, when he found somebody who either he wanted to champion or just wanted to be nice to, uh, he was really involved. He didn't didn't sit on the sidelines and let other people talk to you through him. <laughs> he really was a nice guy. And the thing about Stevie that strikes me years later is just how far he went out of the way to include me and to help me. And over the years, it's really dawned on me how old he was at the time and how much he had going on in his life to give me that kind of time. So uh, it's more appreciated as time goes by. Well, he certainly recognized the immense talent. And I have to tell you, Colin, the first time I heard one of your little big band albums, my first thought was, I wish Stevie Ray Vaughan could hear this. So funny you should say that, because that's exactly what I was saying. You know, my first two records, and I don't want to disparage them, but I will say, when you're 23, 24, 25, you just kind of don't have the uh, breadth of experience. And when you're signed to a major label as well, you really got to come up with some hits, you know, and, and unless you want to be dropped instantly. So in, unless you're one of those, well, anyway, the, the fact is that I love my first two records. The second one, even more than the first, because I had a producer who was really artist friendly and really artist involved. But Stevie didn't wasn't there to hear that, and I I I'm I'm like I that I wish he would have heard those records because I know he would have loved them. He was a real musicologist, you know. He would be able to tell you who played tambourine on a Helen Wolf track. I mean, he was that into it. Yeah. 
Well, I have to say that your 1988 debut album was the fastest selling album in Canadian history. It earned you your first Juno Award. I know you're not thrilled with that album. I hope you like your second album, Sudden Stop, better because uh, to me, it was more R&B and blues. Yeah, well, I had a producer who worked with ZZ Top on that record. And my first record, uh, again, don't get me wrong, I was working with a legend named Tom Dowd. And Tom Dowd had made records with Aretha Franklin. And I mean, you name it, uh, Tom worked with. You name it. Any, anywhere from Bobby Darren to uh, John Coltrane. So, uh, but he didn't really want me to play blues. You know, don't forget, this is the height of the late 80s. And a producer like Tom, who had seen all these people in his life from Almond Brothers to Eric Clapton to all these people, he thought that was kind of like living in the past now. And he wanted to see me do something modern like the Eurythmics. So we kind of butted heads, sadly. And uh, although I enjoyed working with him and being in, being in Miami and recording that record, uh, it was a difficult experience. Well, I'm happy that you stuck to what's true for you, what's authentic for you. How did you handle being famous after your first album made you such a big star so quickly? I guess like anyone else does with difficulty. It was like, you know, I don't think any early 20 year olds ready for that kind of stuff. And uh, but we worked, you know, we just worked and worked and worked and you know, it's, 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 it's a lot. It's a lot at that age. And, and I have to say, I'm kind of happy where I am now. That, that flurry of, of business is, is pretty hard on the head. I mean, my first gig in New York was Radio City Music Hall for six nights in a row, opening up for Steve Winwood. That was my first time in New York City. And that's where I play. I mean, give me a break. So, you know, as much as I, I think back and I, it was some beautiful experiences, man, opening up for Little Feet all through the Southern states and um, playing with Keith Richards, opening for Keith Richards and opening for Steve Winwood. It was all great, but it was a lot of pressure. You know, you got the record company people flying in from Los Angeles. You got and uh, and people who are like, you know, watching your every move. And it's, it's just it was a lot. But. I kind of like where I'm at now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're in a great place now. You have such a loyal fan base. Your concerts are fabulous. I've been to numerous concerts of oh, yours. Fantastic. When you were opening for people like Keith Richards, you must have seen behavior that you knew wasn't healthy. How did you deal with that? Well, I idolized Keith Richards like so many, so many others. And Keith, again, is one of those really nice people. He really is a great, he's a nice guy. And uh, his band, I'm friends with the, some guys in that band now to this day. Waddy Wattel is a good friend of mine. Uh, Waddy plays with Stevie Nicks. And he's on that new, uh, there's a new docu documentary out called um, uh, Immediate Family, uh, who uh, Netflix just put out with Waddy Wattel and Danny Korchmar and uh, Russ Kunkel and uh, Leland Sklar, which is really interesting. Uh, you know, they're not, they're not alone. The whole industry, you know, is fueled on too much, too much downtime, maybe a little too much booze and, uh, and whatever else. And, you know, you just, for me, it's always been about the music. And uh, I, know, I know that sounds like a, a, a trope, but it was never really about fame. And it was never really, I just wanted to do what my heroes were doing, making records. And in, in, in fact, I didn't even consider making records until late in my life. Uh, Steve Ray Vaughan actually said to me, you want to make records, don't you? And I went, do I? <laughs> I, I? I just wanted to play. So what inspired you to create the little big band? When I moved to Winnipeg, when I was 16, I moved to Winnipeg. I, I left, I quit school at 16. I, I, I left home and I moved to Winnipeg and, and, some friends in the blues community there really took me in. I used to have to play this club where they, I have to sit upstairs until like my time was to go on. They get me on for two or three songs and take me straight back up to a hotel room. But some people that are really uh, a guy named Gordy Kidder said, uh, Colin, I know you know about Helen Wolf and Muddy Waters and all those guys, but here's some people you don't know about. And he invited me over to his house one day 
and played me Roscoe Gordon, the guy who wrote Shirley and, and the guy who wrote uh, No More Dog and then the guy and Tiny Bradshaw, the East Coast band leader who did Train Kept a Roll and then Roscoe, uh, Roscoe Gordon and, and all kinds of people that I had never listened to. And I just kind of kept that in my head for years uh, as songs I loved. And around the time uh, of 1993, when Soundgarden and uh, Nirvana and all these bands were, were hitting on, on MTV and on much music and all that, blues rock and, and roots music kind of took a hit. And a lot of people who were in the vanguard at the time kind of went, what's going on? Nobody wants to hear what we're doing anymore. And I, I, I remember thinking, you know, what do I do? And uh, I said to my manager, why don't we do something completely, absolutely different? So we're not, we're not putting energy into something that's not really has the momentum right now. Why don't we put our energy into something that's so outside the box that it might turn some heads that way. And apart from the fact that I just love the music anyway. And so this little idea was born and my producer, Chris Kimsey from London, England, who had you know worked with the Stones and all kinds of people, he was gonna do my next rock record. And we said, how about you come into Little Mountain in Vancouver, we'll do a quick swing record, we'll take two weeks, we'll make it really fast and cheap. Uh, we'll fly in the room full of blues from Rhode Island. So, you know, I remember the day we did it, I was so nervous because I lived here in Vancouver and I'd never met any of them. And there was 10 or 12 of them, I mean, there was, well, four or five horn players. We had Reese Widens from Stevie's band on keys. We had uh, Chuck Lavelle on, on the other keyboard from the Stones, I mean, from Almond Brothers. And uh, I just remember being so nervous to leave the house. I remember saying to my wife, I don't want to go. <laughs> I don't, I don't want to go to the studio today. And at the last minute, I, uh, I grabbed a record that was sitting around and it had a Cadillac baby. I was panicking about material and I threw on a record and Cadillac Baby came on and I went, I love it. I love it. So we went straight ahead and recorded Cadillac Baby on that record just from the five minutes by chance I happened to listen to it that morning. Boy, that's yeah. what you call destiny. Yeah, it was, it was amazing. It was um, truly amazing. And, and working with the room full of blues, uh, some of them have passed on since then. And they were like working with the Chieftains. They were like, the Chieftains, the famous Irish band, were kind of a collective. And I, that goes with Room Full of Blues as well. People who had played with so many people over the years, and they knew all the songs. They didn't read music, none of them. So it was like, I'd say, three hours past midnight, I want to do that by Johnny Guitar Watson. And they'd go, guys, we did that with so-and-so. And, 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 and oh, yeah. And then boom. Uh, no rehearsal, straight in. And we have a gig coming up with the little big band. I'm doing two nights in Vancouver on uh, February 2nd and 3rd at the Commodore. And, and it really, there's no real reason for it, apart from kind of honoring 30 years plus since the making of the record. Uh, but I do have Greg Piccolo flying in from Rhode Island, who plays most of the main saxophone on the solos on all those songs. So I'm excited about that. Yeah, a little big band. My Lord, those albums are amazing. And uh, you already know because you heard my introduction, the last track on your Limelight albums, my all-time favorite Colin James song, Into the Mystic. Uh, did you know when you recorded that song that was first made famous by Van Morrison, after all, did you have any idea that you would become so iconic because of that rendition of that song? None. Absolutely none. In fact, if you look at the records buried on the record, it's number 10. It's the last track on the record. And it was the second time we cut it because I cut it down in Los Angeles with Jim Keltner on drums and Reggie McBride, who played on some Van Morrison records. He played on the, the one that Dr. John produced for Van Morrison. And it fell flat. It just didn't, it didn't do a thing. And I came back to Vancouver and we went back into the warehouse, Brian Adams' studio. And at the very end of the day, I had now Vancouver musicians. I had Pat Stewart, who's actually playing with Brian Adams right now. And I had uh, Norm Fisher on, on bass. No, I had Doug Elliott on bass, actually. And, and, and these guys were not Van Morrison fans. Not that they didn't like Van Morrison. It's just that they didn't know 
that the bass should go a certain way or that, you know, and I just said, hey, I know it's been a long day. How about we try Into the Mystic? Is everyone, I, we've done a million songs. I know we're, we should be done. Can you humor me? And everyone said, all right, all right, all right. And we started in and the, the vocal I put on that song, I'm often reminded by Colin Linden that it's almost all live. I actually swore in the song because I hit a note and I went flat and I, I, I cursed <laughs> about three quarters of the way into the song and it leaked into the drum mics. I know where it is and I can still hear it to this day, but we hit it, you know, we, we, we buried it in the mix, but I have to say no one had a clue. And when I heard that the radio was starting to play it a lot, I went, what? there's all these other songs that we thought were going to be the songs and and it was they were all eclipsed if you think about that record now that's the song people talk about this is a song people wait for and uh you and know you don't disappoint <laughs> you but, never disappoint <laughs> i i love it i love it too because richard bell who played with janice joplin plays keyboards he plays the hammond on that it was one of the he died within about another year of that record so the keyboard playing is the same guy who played on Pearl for Janice Joplin. And, and he was a Canadian. Richard was Richard Bell. Uh, he was on that famous train that went across Canada with Janice Joplin and Buddy Guy and everybody years ago. So I love hearing Richard on that song, too. Well, we love hearing you sing it. I hope you never take it off your concert repertoire. Now, in 2016, you released your Blue Highways album in which you pay tribute to some of your musical heroes. The album spent 10 weeks at number one on the Roots Music Reports Blues Chart. I got to get that in. How did you go about choosing the songs for that album? I did about three records with my same co-producer, Dave Mazaros. He lives in London, England now. And we just, you know, I've done a lot of covers that I love. So it's getting harder and harder to find unrecorded material. So I had, you know, you just got to kind of dig deep. And on that Blue Highways was the philosophy was I want to do a record where I, it's unapologetically blues. And it's somewhat uh, sentimental because the Peter Green early Fleetwood Mac song on it, uh, Watch Out. That double record by Fleetwood Mac uh, before the women joined the band was almost like a, a Bible to me as a kid. I think in grade six. I would put that on and I would walk around the house and, and it had every lick because it had some famous uh, Chicago blues musicians on it. Plus Peter Green, who was an amazing guitar player. So it was like having uh, a lesson at the tip of my fingers. And, and so so that kind of started off. I think I'll do that. And then we uh, we picked uh, a few a bunch of other songs that have always been my favorites and no one expected a whole lot of the record. I found in my life that when you do things out of the love, uh, often the results are, are surprising because sometimes you think, well, I'm just going to do it because I love it. But then you find when you're not competing with or, or trying to have a hit or it just it frees you up a little bit. And I do enjoy songwriting. I'm, I'm working on a record right now where I've written nine out of 12 songs on it. And I love that too. Uh, it's just that uh, sometimes it's nice to put that in someone else's hands <laughs> and just play and enjoy. You know? Well, you know what I really admire about you as an artist is you're very intuitive. There must have been producers and managers in your career who did not want you to venture into the blues. I'm sure of it because of the way the industry is. And yet yeah. you did it. You followed your gut yeah. and you did it. Yeah, yeah. And now, nowadays, all the records that I did that with are the ones that have allowed me to continue. I mean, I'm not saying that, I mean, on my second record for Virgin Records America, I was strong-armed to do a song that I didn't like. I mean, literally told to do it. And normally I would have 
you know, I would have, I would have balked at that and said, Hey man, you know, what do you, you want me to actually record something I don't like? Are you serious? You know, but in this case, it was a big American record company and, and I did it. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I've always regretted it because I don't like it to this day. I don't like it then. I don't like it now. And I, I you know, uh, national steel, the record national steel, the acoustic record I made, I had to pay for that myself until I was reimbursed by the record company because they were disinterested. And so we just went ahead and made it. And later on, they told me that it was their favorite record I made with them. Oh, go figure. <laughs> so, you know, like you just follow your gut. Now, your latest album, Open Road, won you a Juno Award for Best Blues Album. You were also nominated for a Blues Foundation Award for Best Blues Rock Album. What made you choose to record the Bob Dylan song down on the bottom, which if I'm not mistaken, that's a song that he never actually recorded himself. You're absolutely right. It was on, uh, it was on a compilation record of, of people who were let loose with Bob Dylan's songs that were never, uh, never put out. Basically he had reams of writing lying around. They gave it to uh, one of the guys from Mumford and Sons and uh, Elvis Costello and a bunch of people got together and made a record. So I have to I have to credit my co-producer on that one. He said there's a song that I just think would be great, and uh, I hadn't heard it either. And uh, it ended up I love the way it, it it's you know it's it's contemporary in its own way. And and we made a video with it that I had a, a I don't often love doing videos, but that was a great fun. I got to drive a beautiful black Mustang around all day, so that was great. And anyway, I, I I love it, and on that record again, the first two blues records I did. And I have to mention that Blues Foundation Award because that was my first American nomination. It's taken me my whole life <laughs> to get into the blues world in the States. And even then it's a it's a it's a hard world to get into. It's you know it's like I come in late in life and, and as a bit of a uh, out of left field. So I ha I'm still having to to work that, but it was really an honor to be to be nominated this time. And uh, uh, well, you know, Colin, one of the reasons I was so happy to get you on our show is that we have a huge audience in the United States, and our show's televised in the UK. I know that you're far better known in Canada than in those countries, but I think the time is right for you to become a much bigger international star, don't you think? Well, I certainly hope so. You know, England, I don't get to as often as I'd like. I toured with Beth Hart a few years back in England and we got to play some beautiful venues and I really had a great time and we, we did pretty well for a, We were only playing an acoustic duo, me and Chris Cadell. So, you know, it was we were playing big venues. So it was it was nerve wracking for me. We played Festival Hall in London where Billy Holiday played in years ago. So that, you know. Yeah, but you've it's done Radio nice City Music Hall. Like, yeah. come on, you've played at iconic, legendary venues. Well, last year, I mean, and some of them I'm just starting to play now. We, we toured with Buddy Guy last year, and I got to play Austin City Limits at the Moody Theater there. And uh, we, we played we played uh, the Ryman in Nashville, which was uh, just, I've always wanted to play the Ryman. So that was a bucket list. And the Troubadour in LA, we, we played at the Troubadour and that was uh, amazing. Yeah, I think big things are headed your way. If someone in the United States or the UK who's watching this interview has never heard your music, what would be the first album you would want them to listen to as a first step to getting to know you as an artist? Oh, God. That's really hard because see, see the little big band, although I love them, they're very much in a style and it's not, they're not my songs. I mean, I wrote, I wrote satellite. I wrote a rocket to the moon. I wrote some of them on it, but it's really a nod to it, to it, to an era. And I, I love the music. I mean, I, I love it. I think as a writer, I think hearts on fire is maybe my best original record just because I think the songs, I write a lot with Tom Wilson, who's out of Hamilton, Ontario. And I think Tom, apart from being a writer of books now and, and an amazing guy and a very good friend, we've written 35 to 40 songs together now. And on my new record I'm working on right now, he's, we've written just about everything uh, on this one. 
And so, uh, but Hearts on Fire again is a bit of a so- it's a it's a bit of a more relaxed record. It's a bit of more of a sonic, a bit more of a, an Americana sonic record where it's it's not bombastic. It, there's not you know there's no it's not a rock record. Well, but I, I like to give people Blue Highways and Open Road. Nice, uh, I'm good with that. Yeah, I I think when people say to me, you know, what do you recommend? I want to hear Colin James. I always give them those two CDs because I think they really demonstrate so much musicality, so much musicianship. You're really a superstar musician. I don't even know whether you really get that. Well, you know, I love what I do. I mean, uh, I, I truly feel blessed to do what I do. Uh, I um, Right now, and your fans love you. Do you know that? That you're really, <laughs> you have very, very loyal fans. We're very proud of you because you're from our country, Canada. Well, that's awesome. You know, you know, I, I love being out there, you know, w- waving the flag and, and, and doing our thing. I've got a, I've got a brand new American agent uh, agency with the Mint uh, just starting to work with me. And they're already getting me in a few venues right off the bat i think we're looking at a fall tour in the states that i'm looking forward to there's a lot to do still Uh, i'm i'm not nearly done and i you know i just made a record with one of the best rhythm sections in the world charlie drayton on drums uh, who's played with bob he's been playing with bob dylan for the last three or four years but he's uh keith richards drummer and bass player actually from from all his solo records and i've got Daryl Jones on bass from the Stones on my new record, which just blows my mind. He was such a nice guy. Uh, we recorded in Nashville right before Christmas. And I, I, it, it's, I just, it's going to be, in fact, uh, uh, Reese Winans is playing some keyboards down in Nashville on the record today. So I'm anxious to see what happens there. But lots more to do and, and excited about the new record, you know, and uh, so happy I've been able to make a career of doing what, I truly love, and uh, I'm happy I picked a genre that allows you to maybe uh, grow older gracefully. (laughs) Well, you're not growing old yet. I want to tell our viewers that you can learn more about Colin James by his music and other merchandise and see his concert schedule by going to his official website, colinjames.com. Well, Colin, when I looked at your website, there was a quote there from Stevie Ray Vaughan that said, I'm opening doors for you. Walk through them. So my question for you is, when you look back at your career and all the doors you've walked through, are you happy with the evolution of your career and where it's led you at this time in your life? Yes. Yes. You know, you know, you never want things to be easy. Uh, I, I think if everything is easy, you have a tendency to, oh, oh yeah, of course, of course, that's what happens, you know. You get I a sense of entitlement. Yeah, and I still have to work in the states to, you know, I got to play at Los Angeles in front of Buddy Guy last year in a beautiful theater called the Saban Theater, and turn on two thousand people from Los Angeles who may or may not have ever heard of me. And the challenge is nice. Like, it, I, I don't love. I still having to work as hard as I do in the States to get, but on the other hand, it, it it creates something that I still have to do and something I still have to work at. And you can't be complacent. You know, you got to think on your feet and uh, be ready to be humble when a situation calls for it and rise to the occasion. So, you know, it's okay. And I, I have a great family i've got two uh, wonderful kids and uh, a, a marriage of 32 years now and i'm extremely happy well you know you quit school in grade 10 you struggled a lot before finally making it big and you still have that hunger you still have that ambition you know that there's still more to conquer And it's going to happen. It's obvious it's going to happen because the quality of your work speaks for itself. You have the emotional maturity and the stability to handle it. I think fabulous things are going to happen for you in 2024. And I'm so thrilled that you took the time out of your concert tour to speak with me today, Colin. Thank you so much. 
Pleasure, Harvey, and thanks for the great questions. I appreciate that. Our guest has been the incomparable musician and singer-songwriter Colin James. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to my producer, Steve Silver, my director of programming, Deborah Batsafin, my production assistant, Rosa Puzo, my PR directors, Eileen Shapiro and Jimmy Starr, and my entire team at the XPTV1 Network in the UK. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out all the great interviews on the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified when new videos are posted.